Go ahead. I believe Mr. Snedden was concluded, so may I proceed, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. Detective Bonner, how are you doing? Good. All right. Now, there was a lot of testimony about enunciators and curtain sensors and things like that. Did you learn those terms when you were out there in December of 2004? The terminology, yes. Okay. And you learned that because you were out there with some people who had some background in these items, is that right? Correct. All right. You're not an expert in any of this, is that correct? No. And before December the 4th, 2004, if somebody said, where was the enunciator? What would you have said? What is an enunciator? All right. And if somebody said, where is the curtain sensor? What would you have said? What's a curtain sensor? All right. Now, you mentioned in the video that we saw that the person was pretty much standing right on top of that cabinet. Do you remember that testimony? Correct. All right. In fact, the person with the camera was standing some distance away from the cabinet, wasn't he? Not far. Okay, not far, but that's some distance away. That's not on top of, is it? He was, in the position of the camera, the camera was on top of the location. Aha, uh -huh. do we have the exhibit 907? Oh, it's right here, thank you. May I put 907 up, your honor? Yes. Thank you. I'm showing the exhibit tab, 907, at the bottom and then I'll shift back up here. This is your not-to-scale drawing, correct? Correct. And you did not make that at the time that you were out there, did you? No, I did not. You made that when? Yesterday? Or? A couple days ago. All right. Do you remember a piano in that room? Yes, I do. It says, first floor living room area. Where is the piano? It's not in there. I know you didn't draw it in there, but can I have the? It was located right about approximately where the R, where the O, is for enunciator one. All right. Well, anyway, everybody can see that, I suppose. We used to have a pointer. Do you have a pointer? Yes. May I borrow it? Certainly. Thank you. I'm not sure what you do to make it point. All right. Here you go. That's it. So the piano. There's a little alcove over here, is that right, with a window? Yes. And the piano is right in that alcove, is that correct? Correct. Do you remember seeing the piano in the video, the little clip that we just saw? No. All right, and the picture. Let's see which one this is. May I put up 909, your honor? Yes. In the picture, 909, the photographer was standing right in this area right here, is that correct? From that point to pass, I believe a little bit left of where you're pointing. I'm going to object as vague as to whether he's talking about this photograph or the cameraman. Sustained. I obviously meant the cameraman that you were talking about who's taking the video. Because the photographer who took this picture, if he was standing there, you'd see him, right? Correct. So the photographer who was taking the video was standing in approximately this location that were I'm pointing it on exhibit 909, is that right? Correct, and then moved slightly to his left within the filming. Moved over here a little more, is that right? Up closer, but, yes. Okay, alright, now, you heard the video that was played, right? Which video are you talking about? The one that was just played. I forget the number, it was. Our video. Your video. Yes. I'm sorry. Forgive me one second. 908A theoretically is the video that was played. Right. You heard that? Yes, I did. All right. Now, were you aware that there's a volume control on this video player here on the console in the middle of the courtroom? I am aware of that, yes. Okay. Were you aware that all other videos that were played for all subject matter were played between sound level 7 and 9? Yes. Well, I'm sorry. I take that back. No. I am not. Were you aware that Mr. Auchincloss set this video on 1, the sound level 1 to play the 908A? I move to strike this testimony as lack of foundation on the witness's part and irrelevant as to the testimony. Sustained on foundation. Okay. Do you know what setting Mr. Auchincloss put that on when he played it? No, I don't. 
you would agree that there's generally volume controls when you're playing videos, right? There are. Now, you were asked some questions about being aware of the investigation in this case because of your position as one of the detectives in the case, right? Correct. And are you aware that a number of people have testified that the bell that they heard at the time of the video that was played by the defense, that being the video of the test of the alarm, that that alarm is pretty much the alarm that they've been hearing at that ranch in that hallway for years? Were you aware of that? I've heard that secondhand, yes. And you don't have any decibel level tests to produce to the court at this time? No, we attempted, and it was not, it wasn't worth doing. There was no, it wasn't consistent would be the best way to describe it. Well, decibel level tests really don't do you much good unless you have something to compare it with, is that right? Correct. So you're basically saying, yeah, pretty much that's what I heard. I heard a bell, and it sounded like a bell, right? And the volume level, yes. And other people have said they heard what they heard, right? Correct. All right. And I think you answered this to Mr. Snedden, but just to be certain, you personally have no idea how this system was functioning in February and March of 2003, correct? Correct. All right, okay. Let me go back to the phone records now, which is the first thing you testified to. And let me clear some of this out of the way. You have in front of you, I think, exhibits 460, 448 and 449. Is that correct? Correct. And those exhibits would be the packet of, let me withdraw that. Exhibit 460 would be the packet of materials that contain your various charts of phone calls made to and from various people, is that correct? Correct. And 460 also includes the list of the phone numbers that went to and from, is that correct? That's correct. That's a chart that's also in 460. All right, now. 460 was your effort to add certain phone calls, based on records that you reviewed, to the charts that you made previously, is that right? Not necessarily, no. Not necessarily. I always worry about an answer like that. Well, in certain situations, we did. However, in situations where the calls only showed calls between Bradley Miller and Mark Garrigus and did not connect up to the alleged co-conspirators, then we did not include that data in there. Okay, so what I'll do? I think, to be safe, I better take the actual exhibit. Your Honor, may I approach to retrieve the exhibits? Yes. Thank you. Just so we're oriented. Your Honor, I'd like to put up the first page of Exhibit 460, if I may. All right. So on page 1 on 460, you show four calls going between Garrigus and Garrigus and Brad Miller, correct? Correct. And to make that determination, you used the phone records that were in those other two exhibits, 448 and 449. Is that correct? Correct. So 448 were the records of Brad Miller? Correct. All right. And then 449 were the records of Garrigus and Garrigus? Correct. Now, what phone was it that you looked at for the records of Garrigus and Garrigus? His cellular telephone ending in 3900. I'm sorry. Ending in 2100. 2100. Now, Freudian or otherwise, you said 3900. Why would that? That is his office phone. Did you analyze that phone number as well? We do not have those records. Okay. Did you analyze that number when you looked at the Brad Miller records? Yes, I did. Okay. So are some of the phone calls that you've identified on your chart? And I'm putting up the first page here of 460. Are some of those phone records phone calls that were made between the law firm's number of Garrigus and Garrigus and Brad Miller? Correct. Brad Miller's cell phone records have both incoming and outgoing calls, is that right? Correct. So that's not always the case, right? In phone records, you don't always. That's correct, yes. So in this case, you could tell, by Brad Miller's phone records, what calls were being made from that phone and what calls were received in most cases, correct? Correct. Now, let me skip ahead to the next page. And actually this is page 3, because there's a page. If I may, your honor, there's a page on the back of page 1. They're two-sided, so I'll put up what is, in essence, page 3. All right. And this is for 2 to 12 of 2003, is that correct? Correct. And I think you told us, by the way, 
The first two pages say, 05 and they're really, 03? That's correct. I put one up there that said, 05, but it's really, 03. Now, you have lines back and forth. You still don't show which direction the calls are going in your chart, is that right? Correct. And if you go back to the records, you could figure that out, and you did on occasion, is that right? Correct. Except for the three-way calls that you identified, of which there were a couple, I think you testified to. Correct. The rest of them are calls between two different phones? Correct. Okay, so once again, when you put everybody together, when you loop everybody together, it doesn't mean that Brad Miller's phone, for instance, in this, if you look at this chart for 2 to 12, that Brad Miller's phone has any connection to Vincent Amen's phone, is that correct? Only in that they have shaffle in common. Well, but they don't have shaffle on the line at the same time, is that right? No. All right, so from the standpoint of the theory of the prosecution that somehow these people are all related, that's... I'm going to object to that question as argumentative. Sustained. When you say they have shaffle in common, you're simply showing that there's phone calls from Miller to shaffle, however you say his name, and there's phone calls from Shaffle's phone to Amen's phone or vice versa, right? Correct. I object. That's unintelligible and compound. Well, it's compound for sure. Okay. Is it sustained, your honor? I couldn't quite hear what you said. I said it's compound. I didn't rule on the other issue. Go ahead. Spared me an unintelligible ruling. Right. Okay. Well, what I'm getting at here is, the Brad Miller phone and the Shaffle phone have calls that go one way or the other, three calls going one way or the other, right? Correct. And then the Shaffle phone and the Amen phone have three calls going one way or the other, correct? Correct. You have no information from these phone records who was on any of those phones, correct? Yes and no. Okay. You have phones that are registered or purchased by a certain person. And cellular phones at that. And some are cellular phones, so you might assume that the person who has the cell phone is a person who's making the calls, right? Correct. All right, so, but other than that, you don't know. No. Who was on the phone? All right, and you certainly don't know the subject matter of these calls, right? No. Now, throughout here, and I'm not going to put all these up, you listed quite a number of phone calls between Brad Miller and Brad Miller's phone and the Garrigus and Garrigus phones, right? Correct. And those phone calls you listed starting on February the 4th of 2005, right? Correct. So I'll go back. With the court's permission, I'll go back to that page. Yes. And you prepared this as an exhibit in the case of People versus Michael Jackson, correct? Correct. And from these phone records, do you have any information that any of those four phone calls had anything to do with Michael Jackson or any of these other people who were doing whatever they were doing during this period of time? On that particular day, I do not. Okay. In fact, you omitted to list a large number of telephone calls between the Garrigus phone or phones and the Brad Miller phones during the period of time for which you had records, did you not? I don't understand what you're... Okay. Well, let's do this. May I approach? I want to show the witness an exhibit. Yes. I'll tell you what, I'll do it this way, if it's all right with the court. I have exhibit 903, which actually was introduced through the testimony of Mr. Dickerman, and I'd like to turn to a page several pages into it, and I'll put that up. Can I see it, please? Yeah. I'm going to put this up here, and I'm really just showing the top part of it, which is the letterhead of Garrigus and Garrigus, right? Correct. And you mentioned a 3,900. It's a little unclear, actually, as I look at it, but the phone number there is 213-625-3900. That's the main phone number for that law firm, correct? It appears by that particular document, yes. And you had mentioned earlier 3,900? Correct. So you were aware that this is, in fact, the main phone number for the Garrigus and Garrigus law firm, is that right? 3,900 or 3,000. 3,900? 3,900 is the information that I have received from the phone company. Yeah, okay. Well, now we're having some. Where do you get 3,000 from? Does that look like 3,000? It does, a little bit, to me. 
It does. It does when I'm looking at it here. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. That was my concern, too. So let me just show you the document. When you look at it, if I may ask the question here, when you look at it, it really is 3,900, correct? Correct. Okay. I'll put it back up, and maybe I can. There we go. That's the way it is. So that number, 213-625-3900, that is the number that you looked for when you looked for phone numbers starting with February 4, 2005, correct? Correct. Were you aware that Brad Miller was a private investigator? Yes. Were you aware that Brad Miller was working for Mr. Garrigus during the time period 2003, February through March? That is my understanding. Were you aware that Mr. Miller was working for Mr. Garrigus on other cases during that time? I am not aware personally, no. Not personally, but through your investigation, you became aware of that, did you not? I'll move to strike as hearsay, lack of foundation. Overruled. You may answer. As of, I believe, yesterday, I heard somebody mention another case that they were working on together. High profile case, right? Correct. And you would expect a lawyer and an investigator working on a high-profile case, having nothing to do with Mr. Jackson, right? The case you just heard about, the case you heard about had nothing to do with Mr. Jackson, correct? Correct. You would expect that Mr. Garrigus and Mr. Miller, his investigator, would be having telephone conversations about that high-profile case, independent of anything to do with Mr. Jackson or anybody associated with Mr. Jackson, right? Same objection, your honor. Lack of foundation, calls for speculation. Sustained. In fact, when you look at the records, and I have here, your honor, 448, and this is an envelope of records which were the Bradley Miller records. And I want to turn to certain pages. Okay, as luck would have it, they're in a different order. Give me just one second, your honor. I'm going to turn to the page that is the telephone bill of January 8, 2003, and it's page 6 of 29. And I'd like to put that page up on the screen, and it would be from Exhibit 448. All right. Thank you. I'm not going to go through all of these, because they're in evidence, but just as an example, take a few examples here. Here on November 30th of 2002, there is a call from the Garrigus Law Firm to Mr. Miller's phone, is that correct? Your Honor, I'm going to object to this. November is way out of the time frame of the purported testimony offered by the prosecution. This is irrelevant and immaterial. Overruled. I don't know if there was an answer, Your Honor. No, there wasn't. So my question was, it appears November 30, 2002, there was a telephone call from the Garrigus and Garrigus telephone system to Mr. Miller, is that correct? Correct. And let's see if we can. I'm not going to go through all of these again, but let me just do some representative ones here. If we... I'd like to put up page 9 of 29, the January 8th phone bill from Exhibit 448, if I may. Do you see an incoming call? Brad Miller's phone receives a call from the Garrigus and Garrigus Law Firm on December 5, 2002, correct? That's correct. And you see down here a couple of calls. One is an incoming call from the cell phone number you had for Garrigus and Garrigus, is that correct? That's correct. And that would be December 6, 2002? Correct. And it's followed by an outgoing call to the Garrigus cell phone on that same date, three minutes later, right? Correct. In fact, if we go through the records prior to February 4, 2003, the records that you have that start about November of 2002 and go through February 3, 2003, there's quite a number of calls, dozens of calls between Mr. Miller's phone and the Garrigus and Garrigus phones, is that correct? I know now that there are three. We did not extend beyond the relevant time frame during our analysis. Well, and how did you determine the relevant time frame? Based upon what was happening with the family and the events that occurred beginning in the beginning of February and ending mid-March. So when you say you're showing the phone calls that are in the relevant time period, you're saying that you believe somehow support your theory in this case against Mr. Jackson, is that right? I'm going to object to that and ask counsel be admonished. It's argumentative. Sustained. Saying the relevant time period, you're talking about the time period that you believe pertains to this case, right? Correct. But you don't know that the phone calls were made during that period of time. Let me withdraw that, 
you don't know whether or not the phone calls made during that period of time had any relation to this case. I think I can, yes. Do you think some of them did? Correct. Some of them. There are calls being made between Mr. Miller and Mr. Garrigus that have something to do with what he testified to that he was doing in this case, we would assume, right? Well, in addition to that, you have direct calls between Mr. Garrigus and the alleged co-conspirators. You also have direct calls between Mr. Miller and the alleged co-conspirators. That's right. And calls between Mr. Garrigus and Mr. Miller during that same time frame. That's right. But when you put the calls between Mr. Garrigus and Mr. Miller up there, you don't know how many of those pertain to this case and how many of those pertain to the other high-profile case you talked about, right? Your Honor, I'm going to object. It's argumentative and asked and answered. Overruled. No. And you also don't know how many calls pertain to other things that relate maybe to other cases or other matters, do you? Not necessarily, no. Okay. Now, you said you only know of three. I think I showed you four so far, but... I remembered three, but if you showed me four, I know four. All right. Let me ask you to do this, because I really don't want to take up the court's time doing this, if I may. What I'd like to do is take this off the board, and I'm going to, with the court's permission, I'm going to take Exhibit 448, which is the actual court exhibit of the Brad Miller phone records, and I'm going to also bring up a book with some markers on it and let the witness take a look at all of that and see if we can't identify some more phone calls more quickly. May I do that? Fine. Thank you. Thank you. That's 448, and I'll show you my book there, and you can do whatever you want to answer this question. But what I'm going to ask you, after you have a chance to flip through, there appears to be some phone numbers that we already highlighted and put some post-its there so you can find them. And what I'm going to ask you is, after you reviewed that, if that would give you sufficient information to tell me whether or not there appear to be dozens of phone calls between Mr. Miller and Mr. Miller's office and Mr. Garrigus's office prior to February the 4th, 2003. I did it. Dozens, as long as you're talking multiple, as in two or three dozen, yes. Two or three dozen, all right. May I approach with another exhibit, Your Honor? Yes. I was going to say while counsel is looking at that, but by the way, the law firm of Garrigus and Garrigus, you determined, has a number of lawyers in it, is that correct? I know of at least two. Okay. Personally. Personally you know of two? Yes. All right. In fact, besides personally knowing of two, there's five or six lawyers in the firm, is there not? I don't know. I'm going to object to that. Calls for speculation. It's overruled. He said he doesn't know. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as Exhibit 5108. And, Your Honor, this was previously marked for identification perhaps at a point when the jury wasn't in the room, so if I may recite what it is. It is a page from a telephone bill of February the 25th, 2003, to a number at the ranch, 688-1679. And I believe Mr. Snedden agreed to the foundation for that. It hasn't been offered yet. Okay, so I'm asking you to look at Exhibit 5108. You've got that in front of you. And I'd like you to look at the first entry, which is on line 13, for February the 12th, a call at 12.55 a.m. Okay. Does it appear that a call was made at 12.55 a.m. from the ranch to a particular number that's shown there? Do you see it? Yes and it lasted about seven minutes. They were billed for seven minutes? Correct. All right. Do you recognize the number to which that call was placed? I do not. But you would agree that there is a call at 2.55 a.m. that's made from the ranch elsewhere, is that correct? 12.55 a.m. I'm sorry. 12.55 a.m., and it's made to a local, 805, area code. Correct. Destination. All right. Thank you and I have no further questions. Detective Bonner, with regard to the exhibit that was played for the jury, 808, I believe is the exhibit. It was 908A. I'm sorry. 908. 908? Thank you. 908A, the one that was played in the courtroom, the one that you marked the location of the cameraman at the time it was made. Correct. You were there at that location when that film was made, is that correct? Yes, I was. 
And you were obviously in the courtroom when you heard it played for the jury? Yes, I was. Was the sound of those chimes louder or softer at the time that you were standing next to the cameraman in the room than in the courtroom here? I would say it was consistent. All right, thank you very much. I have no further questions. Oh. Oh, maybe I do. I'm just reminded, yeah, before the witness leaves, that there was. We moved 416 into evidence and the court held it back until after Mr. Sanger had cross-examination. And we would now move that 416, 460, I'm sorry. That's how these problems occur, 460 be admitted into evidence. Those are the charts. The charts. They're cumulative to a certain extent, but I'll submit it. Admitted. Any other questions? No, I don't have any questions. All right, you may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Call your next witness. Your Honor, at this time I have a document which I'd like to move. I've had marked as People's 902 for identification purposes. I gave counsel a copy of it yesterday. I'll let him examine it to make sure it's... No, no, that's all right. It's a document from the Superior Court, the State of California, the County of Los Angeles, and it's a five-page document, and it is part of the lawsuit involving the Arvizos and J.C. Penney. And I would move that this document be admitted into evidence. It is certified by the clerk of the court May 26, 2005. Your Honor, I have an objection to that which I'll state in legal terms first. The objection is that the document contains hearsay, and the court will have to look at it to see what I'm talking about. There's a declaration that's just hearsay, opinion. Secondly, it's an incomplete document. Wait, who has the document? I do, Your Honor. I'll... It's an incomplete, if I may just finish my objection. Is that all right, Your Honor? Yes. It's an incomplete document in that it refers to exhibits, I believe, A and B that are not attached to this particular document, and it is also one document that, besides being hearsay, is out of context without those exhibits and without the other documents surrounding it. If you'd want us to approach, I was going to pinpoint the objection. I could state the relevancy, which probably might be helpful to the court. I could do it from here or I could do it at the bench. Why don't you approach? Discussion held off the record at sidebar. Your Honor, there is another item. All right. There is a series of photographs marked 889 through 897, which are the photographs I believe that were relevant to the testimony of Brett Barnes, and they were marked for identification. They were authenticated by at least two witnesses, and we moved that they be admitted into evidence. And I missed the numbers on that. I'm sorry. 889 and 897. I believe the letter is 897. The photographs are 889 to 896. And there might even be a blank space in there. Before we get to that, Your Honor, just so the record is clear, I don't think the court ruled on the record. Your microphone's off, sir. My fault, I'm sorry. I don't think the court ruled on the record with regard to 902. All right, I'm ruling at this point. Without further information, it's inadmissible. Now, with regard to what was just offered, quite frankly, I'd have to take a look at it to see what we're talking about. 889. Could I approach your clerk? I believe she's retrieving them. Yeah. 889 through 897. 895 has not been identified, so it wouldn't include 895. Let me show them to Mr. Mesero. Off the record discussion held at council table. Your Honor, as far as the photographs are concerned, which are 889 through 896, minus 895, which is not being offered, we would have no objection to that series. With regard to the letter, which is 897, that's hearsay, and we would object. 889 let me see those, please, through 896 are admitted. 895, not having been identified, it's not one of the ones I'm admitting. With regard to the letter, I just gave it back. Whatever number that was, 897? Yes. I'll object as hearsay, but I'd also object that this is not proper rebuttal. This is something that occurred during the defense case or was brought up during the defense case, and if it was going to be moved in, it should have been moved in then. But it's still hearsay, so I don't think it comes in either way. 
Do you want to speak to the hearsay issue? Yes, Your Honor. It's reflective of the declarant's state of mind. She was cross-examined extensively about that letter. The author of that letter was a witness for the defense during the defense case. And that letter, without getting into the content of it, reflects her feelings and views of the relationship between she, the defendant and her child, and I believe it's relevant for that, in that regard. I'll take this up later. Would you like a typed copy of that? It's easier to read in a typed copy. If you have one. I don't know that I have one here, but I will get one for you as soon as possible. Okay. Will you give us a copy of the typed copy? Yes. Go ahead. Your Honor, at this time we would like to publish for the jury seven different documents from the 400 series of documents, all in the 400 notebook. These were the documents that were admitted pursuant to a search of the home of Mark Schaffel. I can proceed in a couple of ways. There's two of the documents that will require reading, either by myself or by the jury. So those will take just a little bit of time. And I can publish them on the Elmo and give the jury time to read them. The other documents are short and should be pretty quick to get on and off the screen. So I'm happy to proceed any way you'd like me to. These documents, by the way, are not part of our rebuttal case. They were admitted at the end of the people's case, and we did not have a chance to publish them because of that. And I said I would allow you to publish them. How would you like me to proceed? Just to put them on the Elmo and give the jury time to read them? That's fine. All right, very well. I'll just mention each document as I'm placing it on the Elmo. All right. Your Honor, could we just approach for a moment? Could we approach for a moment? Yes. Thank you. Discussion held off the record at sidebar. Off the record discussion held at council table. I believe council's just going to take a moment to look at the documents before I publish them. That's what we agreed to. Based on the representation that each of these has actually been received, I know the court had some rulings, but based on that representation, I have no objection. All right, thank you. All right, your honor, if I could please have the Elmo. I would object to any reading. I mean, introduce what it is, but I don't think there should be further discussion, except to say, this is exhibit so and so. That's my intention. And if I could confirm with Madam Clerk, was 419 received into evidence? 419, page 3? Yes, 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 it was. Thank you. The first exhibit will be 419, page 3, Your Honor. Whereupon, People's Exhibit 419, page 3, was published to the court and jury. The next exhibit will be 418A. 418A was not received. 418A? 418, page 3, was received. Yes, okay. But 418A? Was not received. Not received, okay. 418? That was received. Whereupon, People's Exhibit 418 was published to the court and jury. The next exhibit I'll ask to publish is Exhibit 417, page 12. Whereupon, People's Exhibit 417, page 12, was published to the court and jury. I'll show a wide-angle view, and then I'll close in on the text portion. Counsel, we're going to stop just for a second. Go ahead, alternate. Could we use the moment to approach on a different matter at this time? Yeah. I think with Mr. Snedden on this one. I'm sorry, Mr. Snedden. What's the matter? Approach. May I know what it's about? Off the record discussion held at council table. Discussion held off the record at sidebar. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes. The next exhibit I will be publishing will be exhibit number 410, page 2. Whereupon, People's Exhibit 410, page 2, was published to the court and jury. And the next exhibit I will be publishing will be 407, pages 2 and 3. And this one will take a little bit of time. These next two are, have some text in them, so I'll probably move in close and then gradually move down the page, with the court's permission. Whereupon, People's Exhibit 407, page 2, was published to the court and jury. If I may, I'll move the letter down. Whereupon, People's Exhibit 407, page 2, continued to be published to the court and jury. And finally, I'll move on to page 3 now. Whereupon, People's Exhibit 407, page
page 3, was published to the court and jury. And then the last exhibit we'll be publishing at this time is exhibit number 405. I'll also move this down slowly to give everyone a chance to read it. Whereupon, People's Exhibit 405 was published to the court and jury. All right, thank you very much, Your Honor. Mr. Sneddon? Yes, Your Honor. Do you have the, remember that short brief you gave me on the issue on this tape, on this DVD? Do I remember the issue? Do you have the brief that you provided me with? On this issue? Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure if I do. Could I check my briefcase? Yes, I don't have mine at bench, so I was just wondering if someone had it. Oh, on the, yes, sir, I know what you're talking about. I'm sorry, your honor, I did not bring my copy with me. I think Mr. Auchincloss can retrieve it on his computer, but to get it printed out would be another thing. Okay, are you going to, are you preparing to play that now? I was. I have a few questions to ask to lay the foundation, but I can have somebody run upstairs and print it out. It may be on, should be on Mag's computer, isn't it? Your Honor, I think Mr. Nicola has it on his computer as well, and we can go up and print it out and have it down here, I think, in just a couple of minutes. All right, I appreciate it. Would you like me to go ahead and at least lay the foundation? Yes, go ahead. All right. I'll call Sergeant Robel back to the stand, Your Honor. You're still under oath. You may be seated. Sergeant Robel, in conjunction with your assignment involved in this investigation, did you conduct an interview with Gavin Arviso? Yes, I did. Do you recall when the first time it was that you interviewed Gavin Arviso? Yes, I do. And when was that? I believe it was July the 6th, 2003. And where did that interview take place? In the city of Santa Barbara. And where in the city of Santa Barbara? At the CERT Cottage. And what does CERT stand for? Sexual Assault Response Team. It's a building that we use to conduct forensic interviews. And was the conversation and interview that you conducted that day with Gavin Arviso tape recorded? Yes, it was. Was it also videoed? Yes, it was. And was there another officer who participated with you in that interview? Yes, there was. And who was that? Detective Paul Zellis. Now, you have had occasion since then to review the tape of the interview with Gavin Arviso, correct? Yes, I have. And you've actually done that on a number of occasions? Yes, I have. Now, with regard to the original interview, what media format was that done in? VHS. And you've reviewed that VHS tape, is that correct? Yes, I have. And later, for purposes, well, later, that VHS was converted into a digital form, is that correct? Correct. And have you had occasion to review the digital form of the interview between you and Gavin Arviso? Yes, I have. And have you, with regard to the VHS original and the DVD copy that was made, do they appear to you to be the same? Yes, they do. Your Honor, I believe that we have previously marked People's 900, and it was marked for identification purposes at that time, and we would now move that People's Exhibit 900 be admitted into evidence. We object, of course, but if it's admitted, it's admitted for a limited purpose. It is. With that understanding, Your Honor, and It's admitted. I'm afraid I've stalled as long as I can. Maybe we'll just start the break. The reason I wanted that is, I want to give a limiting instruction, and I'm trying to develop some words, and so I think we'll just break early so I can look at that. I don't want to show the tape till we've done that. I understand. That's, I understand fully. Thank you. Send it back to me as soon as you. I'm sorry? Send it back as soon as you get it. Oh, send it back. Yes, sir. To the jury, I was going to say, would you step out for a minute? But I got the laugh anyway. All right, what I've been working on, what we've been working on, is an instruction here, and this is an instruction as it relates to this evidence that the district attorney is about to present. 
you have previously heard evidence of Gavin's statements presented by both the prosecution and the defense. You are about to hear and see a tape recording of the interview of Gavin Arvizo by Sergeant Robel and Detective Zealous in July of 2003. This is being shown to you only to observe the demeanor, manner and attitude of the witness. His statements are not to be considered for the truth of the matter stated. Since the evidence is offered for this limited purpose, the defense is only permitted to offer rebuttal evidence for this limited purpose. All right, you may proceed. Your Honor, we're prepared to show the video at this time, and I would request that Sergeant Robel be allowed to sit back here so he wouldn't be in the way for people to see the video. Yes. Is that okay with the court? Yes. All right, fine. I think I should indicate for the record, this is Exhibit 900. It's in evidence. And you should tell everyone about how long it will take to play it. Oh, okay. It's about one hour and four minutes long. All right. Whereupon, a DVD, People's Exhibit 900, was played for the court and jury. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Sanger? All right. I only have a couple of areas to cover with you here. The first one is that there's sniffling you hear throughout that tape. Did you hear that? Yes. That was Detective Zealous, is that right? On a couple occasions it was Detective Zealous. He had a cold. A couple of occasions? There were occasions that it was Gavin as well. And I saw you giving Gavin Kleenex to help him with his sniffling? No, he was wiping his nose with his finger. And you would agree, if people watch that, they can form their own opinion on that? All object is argumentative. Sustained. All right. Now, the other thing I want to ask you about is, and this relates to the demeanor of Gavin Arvizo, because that's our limited scope here, okay? The demeanor of somebody when you're, well, let me put this in context. Excuse me. I think we've already been over this, but you've been a police officer for a long time, correct? Correct. And you've conducted many, many interviews, is that correct? That's correct. And you've conducted many, many interrogations, is that correct? Correct. All right, and there's a difference between an interview and an interrogation, correct? Correct. An interview, you're listening, you're taking notes, you're hearing what has to be said, right? Correct. An interrogation, you're trying to get somebody to tell you something. You think they're not maybe being forthcoming. You want to interrogate them and get it out of them, is that right? That's correct. All right. This was an interview, not an interrogation, correct? Correct. And the demeanor of a person will differ. In your vast experience in this regard, the demeanor of a person is going to be affected by whether or not you're doing an interrogation or an interview, correct? In a way, I don't agree totally with that. Let's start with this. Do you agree mostly with that? When you're interviewing adults versus children, there is a difference in their demeanor, whether, and even interviewing children, there's a major change in there, even if it's a friendly interview, you're going to see behavioral changes in a child versus an adult. All right, you may be reading more into the question than I thought there, but the fact is, if you're saying to somebody in a situation where you are interrogating them and challenging what they are telling you, that is likely to have an effect on their demeanor, as opposed to simply interviewing them and listening to what they have to say, right? That is correct. And in this particular case, Gavin was 13 when you did this interview, is that correct? Yes, he was. And, for instance, there's a part where you ask him what an erection was, if he knew what an erection was, is that right? Yes. And this 13-year-old boy told you he knew what it was because Michael Jackson had told him. Remember that? He shook his head and, I even had a hard time hearing what he said, but he shook his head as, yes. I couldn't say exactly if he said it was Michael or not at this point. Okay, whatever it is, it's on there. Right. Your Honor, I'm going to object to counsel's statements and move to strike. Can't hear you. Object to counsel's statements and move to strike. It's actually foundational to the next question. Well, it. But, whatever. Sustained. Okay, my point is, whatever he said, Whatever he said in response to the questions as to whether or not this 13-year-old boy knew what an erection was, you did not challenge him at that point and say, well, what do you mean? You're 13 and you're telling me you don't know what an erection is, right? 
No, I did not. All right, and you would agree that if you had conducted an interview in that fashion, that that might have resulted in a different demeanor on the part of the witness that you were interrogating, is that correct? Can you ask that again, please? Probably not. Do you want it read back? Yes, please. If we can read have it back, if that's all right, your honor. All right, and you would agree that if you had conducted an interview in that fashion, that that might have resulted in a different demeanor on the part of the witness that you were interrogating, is that correct? Now that it was read back, I actually used two words there that probably aren't compatible. Can I withdraw it and make it more clear? Yes. You indicated you were conducting an interview and not an interrogation, so my question is, if you had used interrogative techniques in response to questions like that, you would expect to see a different demeanor on the part of the subject, no matter who it is, right? Asking that particular question, is that? Sure, I was just using that as an example. Under interrogation versus interview. Yeah, you'd expect to see a different demeanor, correct? Possibly. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. Sergeant Robel, in the course of your training, you have been to a number of classes and training exercises dealing with the specific interview of child sexual assault cases, have you not? Yes, several. And have you ever been to a class where they've told you to use the interrogation and techniques that you would use with an adult with a kid in that setting? No. I would object, Your Honor, as beyond the scope of cross and outside the limited issue. Sustained. Would you ever use an interrogation technique with a child molestation victim? No, I wouldn't. Objection. Outside the scope. Judge, he asked specifically that question. Overruled. You may answer. I would not. It's. Why? Because interviewing a child, he is. This person is a victim, not a suspect, and in this particular interview, I was trained in forensic interviewing, and that is interviewing and not interrogation. Nothing further. And that decision is based on the fact that you assumed that this individual was a victim, correct? I assumed to, the charges that I was investigating, the alleged charges, yes. Thank you. No further questions. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Your Honor, we have no further evidence to present in rebuttal. I would indicate to the court, however, that with regard to the document that we went to the court, to sidebar on, which I believe is 902, that I would like the opportunity to present further documentation on Tuesday morning on that issue, so I could rest contingent upon that. Is that agreeable with you? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. I was trying to remember what document that was, but now I do remember. Do you remember now? I do. So now I'm, I would allow you to try to resubmit that. That was taken under that. Thank you. Before we proceed, could we have a moment to talk? Well, you can have a break if you'd like. Very well. But I wouldn't want to have to take a break and then come back and you weren't going to do anything. Let me talk to counsel if I can, Your Honor. Can we just have a moment? Yeah, let me make a ruling. Counsel, you don't have to move. I'm just... I am going to sustain the hearsay objection to 897. Discussion held off the record among the defense team. Your Honor, the defense rests. All right, both sides have rested subject to one document. That's correct, Your Honor. Your Honor, there's one additional document that the court has under submission as well. That's the letter. And I did furnish. He just ruled on that. Oh. I just ruled it was hearsay. Oh, I'm sorry. You lost it. And I sustained the objection. It's not the first time. To the jury, all right. Then you have heard all of the evidence that you're going to hear in this case. What remains for the court and the attorneys is the process to agree and work out jury instructions. It's hard for me to estimate how much time that's going to take. I know it's going to take a day. I know that. I mean, that's a minimum. And that means that you would not come in on Tuesday. So Monday is a holiday, right? Okay. Tuesday you're not going to come in because we're going to go over jury instructions. 
Now, what I'm going to have you do is to call in on Tuesday afternoon at, let's say, you know, not before, say at 4 o'clock, and there will be a message on whether you're to come back in on Wednesday or, yeah, Wednesday or Thursday. And that depends on whether we get all of our jury instructions done, and I think we will. I really think we will, but I don't want you coming in and, you know, have to wait around. I just don't want that. I want us to be done with our job before you come back. Now, is there a number? What number can I give them? What's your number, Leslie? Mine? No, no. Mine? No, I need. What's a number to give them so that we can have a message for them? Should they call jury services? Jury services would be the best number. You know what? If you'll go back in the jury room, I'll release. Just stay there until the bailiff comes back and gives you a number to call. So it's kind of, I know it puts you on this kind of a situation, but it's better to do it Tuesday afternoon than Wednesday morning. Your Honor, could there be an admonition, given the long weekend? Oh, yes. Thank you. I will admonish you to remember you're not to discuss the case with anyone. You're still not to form any opinions or conclusions, because until you know the law, until you hear the law, until you hear the argument of counsel, you really aren't allowed to decide this case. You've got to wait till that moment when everything has been done for you to decide the case. You're not to go to any place mentioned in the evidence for the purpose of investigation or trying to find out for yourself. You're not to consult any written works, legal works or other works, to try and help you in this case. Remember, you can only decide the case from what you hear on the witness stand and the evidence that comes in. You're not to watch any news events, any news programs. You're not to read any newspapers or magazines relating to this case. And there's an admonition, too, that I never have to give a jury, and you're going to hear about it in the final instructions, but there is a rule of law that prevents jurors, after the case is over, from charging compensation for giving information or accepting compensation for giving information about your experience. And I alert you to that, because it's not something we usually read, you know. It's not something you really, jurors aren't usually offered compensation or have that opportunity. But I wanted to just advise you in advance there are some specific laws about that that affect all of you, and I will give you the actual law when I read it to you next week. And I'll see you probably on Wednesday, but we'll get this phone number for you in just a couple minutes. Take them back and... Yes, sir. All right, is there any reason not to recess until... I don't think so, Your Honor. Until Tuesday morning? I don't think so. You'll be prepared in every respect with your jury instructions, any that you don't have? If I may, Your Honor, I think I may have spoken prematurely. There was an issue yesterday that... Can't hear you. There was an issue yesterday. Microphone. Gordon? He wants to use the mic. Oh. My secretary's reminding me that there was a motion that you're going to file to seal those phone records. Mr. Garrigus's phone records. I'll take care of that. We'll have it on Tuesday morning. I believe the representation was that the motion was going to be to seal everybody's phone records. All phone records, yeah, okay. Your Honor, there was an issue yesterday where I stipulated to some emails that it appeared had been sent from Mr. Miller's office to Mr. Garrigus's office. I later learned that there was some documents attached to that exhibit that were not strictly emails. I think Ms. Yu and Mr. Zonin met with you about that. They did and I was not stipulating to the non-email documents. And I did discuss that with Mr. Zonin as well. I don't, I think. They're not, that was explained to me. Those are not in evidence. Yeah, okay, thank you, your honor. The entire packet has been withdrawn, is that right? The entire packet has been withdrawn. Make sure my clerk knows the number of that packet. Okay. Anything else? Not from the defense, Your Honor. Just one minor detail, Your Honor. We now have the redacted portion of 908A, and we'll submit that to the court for admission at this time. 908, we will. It's marked, and it will be an exhibit, but we will not ask for its admission. And out of an abundance of caution, 
it's the old pig in a poke as opposed to the horse in the arena thing. I should probably listen to it once. It's only 40 seconds. I have a copy for defense counsel. Maybe what I could do is just play it here. After you leave the bench, play it here real quick, listen to it. If it's okay, we will submit it. If not, we'll bring it up Tuesday morning. That's fine. What time did the court want us here Tuesday morning, your honor? We're going to conduct court the same time as we have. Regular hours, okay. Okay. Okay, thank you, your honor. I intend to do that during deliberations, too. Deliberations will only be during the same hours as we've had court. 